So we're on Revelation 14 1. 14 all right, so 14 and 1. So we just finished chapter 13 where we were reading about the two beasts. So we get this image. We have this kind of scary chapter, last chapter about the beasts. And the beasts were representing the, the latest empire, which is Rome, and the emperor himself. Uh, and the, the big the big problem at this time is the, uh, the cult of emperor worship. Right? So the emperor is demanding at this time that everyone worship him. It's kind of an umbrella religion in order to unify all the disparate parts of the Roman Empire, which had their own local gods. But he allowed them to worship their local gods as long as they also worship him. Thank God. Somebody's got their mind over there. Guys, can you check your, uh, on Zoom, can you check your mics to see if uh, somebody has an open mic? Yeah. I, have an, I have an open mic, but no sound. Okay, I think it was Neil. All right. All right, here we go. All right, so chapter 13, we have these, these beasts representing the emperor and the empire. <clears throat> and now, 14.1, uh, he has an, another vision. This one's a little bit more positive, a, a vision of victory. He says, then I looked and behold, which is a kind of formula for introducing a new vision. A lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with him 144,000, having his father's name written on their foreheads. So he's standing on Mount Zion, which was the, the name of the mountain where the Jerusalem is on. <clears throat> so he's standing in the holy city, uh, victorious. And with him were the 144,000, which where did, what did the 144,000 represent? Do you remember? This. Yeah, hold on. We encountered it. I had in my notes. It was that's the it's the church militant. It's yeah. the, the number of the uh, redeemed, the number of the saved, the elect. It's all of us, in other words, one hundred and forty-four thousand. Okay. It was sealed by the angel earlier. So the one hundred and forty-four thousand are are us, those who the the Christians, the all believers, Christians. those all of us who are have been sealed in the name of the Father. Uh, and have his name written on our foreheads. For us, we do that when we chrismate, when we make the sign of the cross on the forehead. That's the, the Father's name, the cross, is written on our foreheads. <clears throat> so we're we're sealed by the angel. That was from chapter 7 that we first saw these 144,000. And that in chapter 7, we saw this image of the church in heaven, the church triumphant, and we saw the 100, which was an innumerable amount. And then we saw the 144,000, which are those of us who are still on earth. The believers who have been sealed in his name. So the Lamb is, of course, Christ. In chapter 5, back in chapter 5, the Lamb was the one worthy to unloose the seals of the scroll, right? He was, the, yeah. I'm sorry, question. Yeah. You're saying what, 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 it is us. All those great young people are going to be all the No, it's not. <laughs> so it's not a literal number. It's 12 yeah. times 12,000. And uh, in the in the Greek numbering, ten thousand was the highest number that you could you could write out was ten thousand. So to say twelve times twelve thousand, know, which, which which was like the highest number you could. It's like saying a uh, hundred million, a hundred billion, or something like that. It's a pretty large number. It's not a little number. At one time, I, and I've heard, and this is why hearsay isn't good. This is what we need to get to the source and get to the truth, you know. Yeah. But I heard that 144,000 represented the 12 tribes of the Jewish people. That's why. So yeah, some people. That's what I thought. There, that's, why, that's why I wanted to ask to make sure I heard you right. I think that is true, but we're going to interpret it as, as Orthodox. We're going to interpret that differently than some Protestants. So, whereas the Protestants will tend to take that as literally the 12 tribes of Israel, the Jews, the way we understand it, going back, if you remember, going back to Romans chapters 9 through 11, <laughs> when we talked about Israel, remember that 10 of the 12 tribes had been lost from a long time ago. From 700 BC, 10 of the 12 tribes were lost. And Paul explains in Romans how 
they were gathering these lost tribes. And it's not that they were lost completely, it's that they were dispersed into the world, right? And this, is, this was true uh, in general, is that the Jews, like the Greeks, lived in diaspora. There were, there were Greeks all over the world, there were Jews all over the world, living in small pockets in every country in the world. And, so it, and then they mixed with those people. So what Paul is saying in Romans is that when, when the Gentiles come from the nations, which we, we see again and again in this image, even in Revelation 2, of, of this message going out to the nations and the nations coming to worship God and Zion, and that it's, this is the reclaiming, the reconstituting of Israel. But those lost tribes have mixed with the nations. They come back now and they reconstitute Israel as the 12 tribes. So, uh, it's the we could say it's the 12 tribes representing this kind of wholeness, the fullness of Israel. But the difference we have with the Protestants is we say it's not just ethnic Jews, right? It's it's all uh, all believers, all believers, whether they're Jewish okay. or or not. Okay, because mm -hmm. yeah, because we have finally come, you know, yes. we're adopted. Yes, we're, we're, well, the, we're you, the new Israel is those that believe in Jesus Christ. That's, that's what yes. it is. They're not it's Jews a, anymore. Jerusalem. That, but Jews that, don't believe in Jesus. A, they're going to say it's a new Jerusalem. It is, right. but if that's in your heart, it's not a piece of land. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> but when we read the epistle, sign it didn't all these places noted. Wasn't there 12 places noted? And then it said, including visitors um, yeah. from Rome and others from. Yeah, to other Jews or something like that. I didn't notice that there were twelve. That's that 12, would be yeah. interesting. But see that that part of what that that's a good example from Acts there. Uh, Act the beginning of Acts where it depicts the day of Pentecost. What it wants to show is that it was a feast. There were three main feasts in, in Judaism: Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. That all Jewish men, in particular, were at least theoretically required to attend, <laughs> and so even those who lived abroad, they wouldn't attend all three every year, maybe. But the communities abroad, let's say a Jewish community in Rome, a Jewish community in Alexandria, etc., would would send delegates to attend these feasts as they could, <laughs> and so you had this image of on this feast day in Jerusalem of all the Jews from all the nations being present, uh, which is an image of the church being reconstituted, right? And so that's why the Holy Spirit comes down on all of those gathered there, and they all become Christians at that time. Thousands become Christians. So, yeah, it represents the reconstituting of the 12 tribes of Israel. And that's where the Christians, the Protestants, are misled, because what they're doing is the Zionists is pulling all the Jewish people from all over the world to yes. occupy Palestine, thinking they're making it the new Israel, and that's not Israel. That's yeah, and that's never been the that's a piece of history. Yeah, Sorry. that's never been the Orthodox interpretation. That's a new interpretation, just in the last hundred and fifty years or something like that. Are the, are the twelve apostles and the twelve thrones indicative of twelve times twelve? Twelve from the tribe of Israel. Is yeah, the new twelve. The, the, new, the new reconstituted Israel. They're on the thrones judging the reconstituted tribes of Israel because the ten had been lost and now they've been reconstituted, uh, including meaning that the Jews had mixed with the nations in there. And so in some sense, everyone was now a Jew uh, because they had mixed with the nations. <clears throat> now they were coming back. And so you, you got to go back to Paul in Romans 9 through 11 where he talks about being grafted on the Jews who didn't believe are, are cut off in, in that kind of you know, cutting a branch off of the tree, it leaves a, a hole. And you could graft on another branch into that hole. <clears throat> and so the unbelieving Jews were cut off, according to Paul and Romans, and the believing Gentiles from the nations that had been mixed with the ten tribes, ten lost tribes, are now grafted into that hole and made a new branch of the tree of Israel. <clears throat> So, all right. Um, all right, so in chapter five, this is the lamb is the one who's worthy to unloose the seals. And in chapter seven, the lamb we see receiving the praise of the innumerable multitude of heaven. Uh, now he's standing with his church on earth, on Mount Zion in Jerusalem, victorious, right? So after these images we had in chapter 13 of the power of the two beasts, the empire and the emperor, now we get this image so that we're not kind of 
falling into despair about the images of the beast. Uh, <clears throat> now we see this the ultimate picture of Christ standing victorious with his church. So we're reassured. In verse 2, And I heard a voice from heaven, like the voice of many waters, and like the voice of loud thunder. And I heard the sound of harpists playing their harps. They sang, as it were, a new song before the throne, before the four living creatures and the elders. And no one could learn that song except 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. All right, so it's a new song of the church. And every time... And in the Old Testament, and we're going to see this as uh, as we go on today, uh, when God worked when God worked powerfully within history, the response of the people was to create a song to uh, commemorate God's saving action in history. And we see this in the Psalms all the time too. They talk in the Psalms, a new psalm was written or created to uh, to commemorate God's saving action in history, his, his wonders that He works for His people. <clears throat> So this is what it's talking about, a new song, because a new saving action has happened. Christ has come, the Lamb has come, and so it deserves a new song that's sung by who? By the, by the church, by the church uh, militant here on earth, the 144,000 who were redeemed from the earth. All right, so the interesting thing is here, though, that his throne, the Lamb's throne in heaven, <coughs> is, has moved from heaven to Mount Zion in Jerusalem, and his heavenly court in other words, the four living creatures, the cherubim and the elders, the 24 elders, presbyters, have come down to Mount Zion to Jerusalem with him. So his heavenly throne room has descended and onto Jerusalem. Uh, and they go wherever Christ is. St. John Chrysostom says that heaven is wherever Christ is. Um, talking especially about when we gather together as the church in worship. Uh, when we gather together uh, around him, when he becomes present in the, in the bread and the wine, he becomes present as his body and blood. We're gathered around him. That's where heaven is. We're in the divine liturgy. We're in heaven. In a sense. <clears throat> All right. Four. These, the 144,000 who were, who were redeemed from the earth, these are the ones who were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. So, in other words, uh, Probably doesn't, you know, some people will take that literally, uh, because virginity was definitely highly praised in the early church. Um, but probably more likely, uh, it's referring to those who are unsullied by worshiping the emperor, right? So those who have kept themselves pure, because you look in the Old Testament, I've talked about this before in sermons, that this imagery of God as the, the groom and Israel as the bride, <laughs> Right, and so then there's this Im imagery of when Israel goes off after false gods, it, it's called, you know, Israel has played the harlot. Uh, in other words, so it's, it's this marital kind of relationship, and it's saying that they have been unsullied, <clears throat> so they've been faithful to their womb. It's the God of Israel. These are the ones who are standing redeemed. Those who haven't bowed to the emperor, haven't offered incense to the, the statue of the emperor, but have been faithful to God. These are the ones who follow the Lamb wherever he goes. These were redeemed from among men, being first fruits to God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no deceit, for they are without fault before the throne of God. So it, what does it mean, redeemed? They were redeemed because they were previously, we were all enslaved to the devil, right? To the powers of this world. But we were redeemed by Christ. By Christ. So redeemed life on Passover not on the Day of Atonement. So this is something we've talked about before, but it's important to remember because, especially because we live in the West and we live in the South here, uh, we live in the Western world and we live in the Southeast United States where there's a very big Protestant influence. Uh, and in the Western church, the Roman Catholics and Protestants together, there's a very big emphasis on the Day of Atonement, right? So the Day of Atonement was a ritual, uh, one one day a year where there were two goats. One was the scapegoat that was sent off and one was the goat that was sacrificed. <clears throat> and this was a day to atone for the sins of Israel. There's another, uh, and then another uh, important ritual or celebration is Passover, right? Which actually is a much bigger celebration. This is the, the celebration of Judaism, Passover. So 
In the Western Church, what's happened is that, unfortunately, all the emphasis has gone on the Day of Atonement. And so we see, um, like, Good Friday. Good Friday becomes, in the Western Church, kind of the biggest, besides Christmas for some reason, Good Friday becomes, like, the biggest day of the year, especially at Easter time. Uh, for example, like I was, I was telling you about this, uh, what's that church called? Highlands. Highlands, they, they had a, they rarely have a Eucharist service, uh, which is just symbolic for them, but they had it this year on Holy Friday. Holy Friday traditionally is the one day of the year when we can't celebrate liturgy in the Orthodox Church. This is the like, one day of the year where they do celebrate the symbolic body and blood of the Lord's Supper. Why? Because for them, Holy Friday, Good Friday is like the biggest day of the year because all the emphasis has gone on to this image of the Day of Atonement. That Christ atoned for our sins with his blood, right? And that's definitely part of the imagery in the Bible, but it's not the only image of what Christ has done for us. And unfortunately, in the West, it's become, it's become kind of the only image of what Christ has done for us. What he died on the cross, his work on the cross, is this, this re- casting of the day of atonement but in the eastern church we have that yes but we also emphasize more passover <laughs> passover is the one where the lamb is right and that's what we're talking about here in revelation is it's not talking about a goat which is which is what the day of atonement was two goats we're talking about the lamb and the lamb is specifically associated with passover and the greek word for passover is pasta Right, so our Easter or Pascha is the new Passover, not the new Day of Atonement, the new Passover. And this is, so this is important. I mean, that this is how they're redeemed. They're redeemed just like in Passover. What happened in the Old Testament? They were redeemed from slavery in Egypt. They were bought out of slavery in Egypt. Is it the same day when the Israelite people uh, kill the that's the Passover, the lamb, the lamb. So there's two. So that's why there's two different things. So a lot of times in the West, they all get kind of smushed together into the Day of Atonement. But we got to remember they're actually two different days. So we do recognize that Good Friday was a kind of recapitulation of the Day of Atonement. There is that symbolism. But there's also the Passover, which happens the next day or two days later. Because of the blood of, of the, the lamb. Blood. And the blood of Jesus, we yes. pass it, we sin and we're going to heaven. Yes. And whoever do not believe Jesus, they're not going to heaven, yes. no matter what you do. Right. We you say, why, you know, okay. We say in the prayers before Holy Communion that the blood of Christ, so in the Passover, not the day of atonement, the Passover, they sacrifice the lamb. And they painted the blood of the lamb on the doorposts of yeah. the houses so that the angel of death would go by. Yeah. In the prayers before Holy Communion, we say that we paint our body by taking the blood of Christ so that we are marked also as so that the angel of death passes over us. We no longer experience that. Yeah. This is all tied into Passover, Passover, not the Day of Atonement. We may celebrate the Day of Atonement, the Western Church. Their, their Holy Friday, or did they move to our Holy Friday? Oh, but it's the other one. It's, the, it's, it's theirs. It's, it's, it's theirs. Their, it's their yeah. Holy Friday. Their Holy Friday. Yeah. So they never yeah. tie back into our dates or. No. Mm -hmm. And it fascinates me. Most Protestant churches don't celebrate Pentecost. Yeah. That's yeah. Not directly tied to Passover, too. Right. That's 50 days after they left Egypt. Yeah, yeah, it's, mm -hmm. there's a, a kind of exclusive emphasis on the Western Church on this Day of Atonement ritual and on the work of Christ on the cross. And you hear that too. I mean, if you if you listen to uh, our Baptist friends or so on, they're always talking about you know the, the work of Christ on the cross, the blood of the cross, etc. And that's true. That definitely is part of it. But here, the imagery is of the Lamb. Which is the Passover, not the cross, right? So it's the it's the the, the resurrection. Because the day of atonement without the resurrection, yeah, it's not exactly. It's just In the Western Church, unfortunately, what it's become is that all the emphasis is on Holy Friday, or for the Catholics, for the Protestants, on the cross, and the. The resurrection is basically in Western theology turned into a, a receipt. 
from God that says the sacrifice has been accepted. Mm -hmm. So in other words, he, he raises Christ from the dead just to show that I have accepted the sacrifice. But so all the emphasis is on just this idea of the day of atonement. But that's not how we see it. We see things more broadly, uh, including, this, and we try not to confuse the day of atonement with the Passover because the Passover is the lamb. They have a ton of the goats. And the scapegoat was sent out into the wilderness, right? Right. The so, scapegoat wasn't killed. And were those sins actually ever forgiven or just sort of pushed toward the cross? Pushed well, away? yeah, I mean, part of it, part of the, uh, the idea that Jesus was sacrificed outside the city walls, I mean, it was just outside the city walls, but part of the uh, symbolism is that he was the scapegoat being sent outside the city into the wilderness where, where eventually, presumably, the scapegoat would die of natural causes or be eaten by a predator or something. Mm -hmm. you know, the scapegoat was never sacrificed. I don't want to stay up, and I may know this, but I've got the mark. It says the mark, and it says the name of the Father, the seal. What is it? A cross? Is it a symbol? What is it? We would say that it's, you know, when we chrismate with the cross, yeah. and we say seal, remember, seal. like we seal, 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 that's the seal uh, marking us off as part of the redeemed. But is it a visible seal to people? It's like we do, like yeah. you just said, it's not like black ash up here. With right. the cross. It's not a red mark or anything like that. Yeah, we wouldn't say that, that it's a... Uh, Visible to the naked eye, to the naked visible eye. to the spirit. spirit. Yeah. And once we're sealed, that yeah. seal will never leave us. And we we can the, turn our backs yes. to it, but yes. we're always sealed if we keep our face yes. facing God. We can always reject it if we want. It's yes. our free will, mm -hmm. but you know we're always sealed as long as we choose to remain sealed. Mm -hmm. All right. uh, <laughs> Okay, so, so this this vision of the victorious lamb and the redeemed being the first fruits of God is supposed to uh, give us kind of an image of hope after the distressing images of the beasts in the last chapter. All right, 14 and 6. Then I saw another angel flying in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel to preach to those who dwell on the earth, to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people, saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to him, for the hour of his judgment has come. And worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea and springs of water. All right, so talking about his judgment, and, and all these images are leading to the, the judgment on the last day, right? And all of these images of the whole book are different kind of perspectives, angles, looking at the end times in the last day, which is ultimately God's judgment. What do we mean by God's judgment? So in the Old Testament, when it talks about God judging the earth, <clears throat> it means putting things right. This is what judgment means. So um, if you, and throughout the Old Testament, they're particularly concerned with this idea of, of justice. So for example, um, the, the 12 tribes of Israel, the, the land was allotted to people. Everyone owned a certain plot of land. There were boundary stones marking off which land they owned, etc. Uh, over time, what would happen uh, is that people would get into financial distress and they would end up selling the land that belonged to them, right? But every 50 years on the Jubilee year, all those debts were wiped away and the property was returned to the, to the people to the proper people. And this was this idea of justice, of returning things to the proper order where everything was just. So this idea of God's judgment is like this great jubilee where everything is going to be returned to its proper justice, uh, where all the exploitation of one man against another will be wiped out and everything will re be returned to its proper place. <laughs> so as an example, uh, it's interesting and that the Jews found all sorts of way to get get out of doing this on the Jubilee year. So one of the things that the rabbis came up with, the Pharisees, was that they would uh, they would sell. Let's say let's say they had acquired a great deal of land and money and wealth. Uh, they would at the Jubilee uh, time when it was time to uh, do away with those sins, they would sell for a, like a dollar what they had to a Gentile. 
and then they would buy it back for a dollar after it had passed. So it was it was a way to get around having to actually do this. But ultimately, but God is not to be mocked, right? So at the end of time, on the last days, God's judgment will come, and things will be will be returned to the right order. So one example was, uh, it seems that around Jesus' time, that the high priest's family owned about 70% of the land in Judea, not owned by the Romans. Now, how did he manage to acquire all this land? It was because by raising temple taxes, uh, the, the religious tax, people would be taxed out of their property. They would end up having to sell their property to the high priest uh, in order to pay the temple taxes. So he ended up accruing this, amassing this huge amount of land. So part of what uh, John is warning here about the judgment to come is that uh, even though the Jews say they're looking forward to the last day when God will, will judge, um, John is questioning whether they're really going to be so happy after all on that day because a lot of them have exploited their fellow men and are going to suffer loss on that day of judgment when God rights all the wrongs. <clears throat> so that's what... That's what judgment is, writing things, putting things back in order. So Paul, for example, just as a little aside, Paul says if we judge ourselves, we won't be judged. So what does that mean? It means if we look at our own faults and how we've exploited our fellow men, how we've uh, held a debt against someone, either literally a debt or maybe a debt of uh, not forgiving somebody, uh, that if we examine ourselves and judge ourselves and put it right by going to confession, it's put right in this life so that when God's judgment comes at the end of time, we won't suffer loss, right? We will already have rectified ourselves in the situation, so God won't be forced to rectify it and we'll suffer loss. So that's why Paul says if we judge ourselves, we won't be judged at the end of time. So the, this is kind of behind the idea of confession. Let's set ourselves back in order. So that God doesn't have to do it. All right, fourteen eight, and another angel followed, saying, "Babylon is fallen, is fallen, that great city, because she has made all nations drink of the wine of the wrath of her fornication." All right, so the original there's two Babylonian empires. There's the original Babylonian empire, which was kind of the first empire. We're talking around fifteen hundred B.C. In the, in the Bible, in the Old Testament, they're known as the Amorites. The Amorites. This is the first original Babylonian empire. Um, and then the last, but, and it becomes symbolic of all empire. It becomes the first in a series of empires that will dominate, especially the, the Mediterranean world. <laughs> so, uh, like in Daniel, he sees the series of empires. So you have the Babylonians, you have the Persians, you have the Neo-Babylonian Empire, which was the one that came in around 600 BC and destroyed the first temple and took the, many of the Jews off into exile. Uh, then you have the Greeks and the, uh, with Alexander the Great, and then you have the Romans. <clears throat> All of these are kind of symbolized by Babylon. The word Babylon symbolizes this great empire that is set against Israel, this uh, Oppressing Israel. And a lot of Protestants think it's the Catholic Church and by association with us. Yes. It's Babylon. Right, right. So, yeah. But what it's referring to here is Rome. And, and their time, the, the great empire of the time is Rome, which they saw as the new Babylon, this new kind of den of iniquity, of oppression of the Jewish people, uh, etc. <laughs> Just as the Babylonians had destroyed the first temple, the Romans destroyed the second temple in 70 AD. Um, and more importantly, like Nebuchadnezzar and the Neo-Babylonian Empire, Nebuchadnezzar made all people do what? Worship. Worship. Worship his idols. So the same thing was happening now with Rome. Even with the Greeks, too, Alexander the Great, he kind of, kind of developed and people began to worship him as a god. And uh, he didn't really... Uh, stop that so it, it's kind of become a pattern that these great empires develop and the emperor uh, develops this idea that he should be worshipped as a god that there should be an idol that people worship of him um is the pope considered like that so the protestants would yeah the protestants would consider after the fall of rome that the roman church 
uh, in particular, and maybe maybe us by association because we all seem we seem the same as Catholics as little as they know about us. Uh, that the Roman Church became the new Babylon, <clears throat> and that the Pope is the whore of Babylon that we're going to see later in Revelation. <laughs> this is a Protestant interpretation. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty typical. That's why there's such such virulent anti-Catholic hate. Uh, Especially, especially here in the South. I mean, that's probably, I, I imagine 100 years ago, it was much, much worse. Mm. But now it's kind of tampered down. But even you see still like in how, it's kind of unique here in the South, how I, I've always found it funny. They'll say that, they'll say, are you Christian or Catholic? <laughs> you know, they don't, yeah. so, because Catholics aren't Christians for them, right? Yeah. Yeah. Are you Christian or Catholic? So uh, sad. <laughs> All right. So, and this 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 yeah. Babylon has fallen. This fallen is yeah. a is, is a quote from Isaiah twenty one nine. Isaiah uh, is kind of taunts the Babylon, the historical Babylon, by saying, "Fallen, fallen is Babylon." Um, and so John is taking this from Isaiah and applying it to the new Babylon, which is Rome. <laughs> so Babylon and the Chaldeans. The Chaldeans were the residents or the people of Babylon, these terms are used uh, not only here in Revelation, but in the Dead Sea Scrolls, for instance, which were about the same time, <laughs> first century AD. They also used Babylon and the Chaldeans as code words for Rome. So that he's talking about Rome, here, the latest empire that people have sold themselves to, that they've uh, adopted the ways of the empire, the ways of the Romans, uh, and forsaken the worship of the true God, instead of worshiping the emperor and his empire. <clears throat> I mean, this, we can see the same thing now and throughout history, too, that, you know, there's a fine line between worshiping the world and the powers of the world and the princes of this world uh, and worshiping the true God. You know, as Christians, it's a fine line. We're supposed to respect our rulers, but we shouldn't be in love with worshiping the world. <clears throat> All right, so in the wine, the wine of the wrath of her fornication, in other words, is people's engagement with this empire, with this, with the world, uh, that they're fornicating with the world by uh, offering incense to the emperor, etc. It's this idea of harlotry, of forsaking their true groom, uh, their true husband, which is Yahweh, the God of Israel. All right, 14 and 9. Uh, then a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If anyone worships the beast and his image, remember that's from the last chapter, you have the beast and the image of the beast, which was the idol of the emperor, and receives his mark on his forehead or on his hand, he himself shall also, remember we saw this with the, the mark of the beast and 666 is his number, uh, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out full strength into the cup of his indignation. So poured out full strength is saying that, you know, wine typically in the ancient world was, was very strong. It was always mixed with water to some degree, and more or less water. And so he's saying it's poured out full strength. So the image is uh, uh, undiluted uh, kind of, it will be experienced as a wrath or indignation of God, but it's simply God put at his judgment, putting things back in order, which is going to be experienced by those of us who have not kept God's commandments. If, if I'm the high priest and I've confiscated 70% of the land from my fellow Jews, then it's going to appear to me wrath when all of that is stripped away from me in God's judgment. <clears throat> but it's not necessarily that God is angry, right? Well, simply God is doing what he does, which is putting things back into order. And at the same time, he's putting the nature and the world back in order as well, isn't he? Yeah, exactly. And that's why it says, for example, in these images of his judgment that the lion shall lay with the lamb, and so there's these images of animals being at peace with one another, no longer exploiting one another, one being a predator of the other, etc. All right, so he's saying um, those who worship the beast in his image, those who have sacrificed to the emperor and receives his mark 
on his forehead or on his hand, whatever that mark may be, we don't know. Uh, he himself shall also drink of the wine of the wrath of God. <laughs> All right, and, and then he continues, he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. So this is a, so those who are not faithful to the Lamb, to Christ, uh, will suffer eternal torment. You know, this is probably not a very popular uh, image for us. None of us really like to think about hell, but there it is. That, but it's important that they, it's the presence of the Lamb. The presence of the Lamb is what torments with fire and brimstone. So what does that mean? So in, like, in Hebrews, the epistle to the Hebrews, for example, it says God is fire. God is a fire. That, and the fire either purifies, you know, if you put gold in a fire, it will purify the gold of its impurities. Or fire will consume something. If it's something that's trash and like can be burned up, it will, fire will consume it. So God is this consuming fire. And it's not that he... It's not that God hates those who are wicked, it's that they hate him. And the being in his presence will be like this consuming fire. And their hate for God will allow the fire to consume them. Their, their disobedience to God, they're not keeping the commandments of God. So we see this, for example, um, in, the, uh, in the tabernacle or in the temple, <clears throat> when the sons of uh, and the sons of Aaron, remember, the two, two priests, of the sons of Aaron, come into, they're drunk, and they come into the tabernacle and offer incense at the wrong time. And they're consumed by, they're burned up by fire, right? Because they've come into the presence of God. God fill, God's presence fills the tabernacle or the temple. And when they come in to, in, are in close proximity with the presence of God, but in an unrepentant state, in a disobedient state, then his presence burns them. Right? His presence consumes them. Whereas, you know, it's almost like... Um, just like a magnet. What's it's that? just like a magnet. A magnet, yeah. yeah. Or if what do you think the, about... The, the, the metal we can attach, you can put it on and the magnet attacks it. But if it is metal, they not fit. No yeah. matter how much you touch it, it doesn't work. Yeah. The same thing with God. Yeah, that's... Or like if we think you about that. fire, fire can be can have, be a double edged sword. Like if it's winter time and we're cold and we sit next to a fire, the fire is warming, the fire is good, etc. But if we move too close to the fire, we're going to be burned. Right. right. So it's a two edged sword. Yeah. Just a, excuse me. We've seen instances in, in studies I've been in recently where um, the like like at Pascha. When the holy fire comes down in the in the, in the temple, and um, I mean in the sepulchre, yeah, and that fire doesn't burn a mm -hmm. lot of holy fire. I mean, like at Pentecost also, that fire didn't burn them. Right. Okay. Right. Yeah, that's a good image. Yeah, mm -hmm. good because it's a it's a holy fire. Uh, it's it's God is a consuming fire, mm -hmm. but it, it's not dangerous to those who are uh, God. prepared to be in its presence. <laughs> Have you seen it? Holy fire. Like, in Greece, we used to get it every year. Yeah. I mean, in Greece, and, and the Holy Fire actually in, it takes place in Jerusalem on Holy Saturday around 2 p.m. It doesn't take place at midnight. It takes place around 2 p.m. And he, he, when he brings the fire out, there are planes standing at the ready um, to go to Moscow, to Athens, to Thessaloniki, etc. Um, and so, as soon as the fire comes out, they have this whole system where the planes go out. And so, by ten o'clock, usually we would get the holy fire in Greece, and then we would somebody would go and meet it at the airport, bring it back in the procession to the church, and then we would hand it out to the people. Like usually, the mayor or somebody like that would be the one assigned to go receive it from the airport. He would bring it to the church. And then we would hand it out, uh, but it was the actual holy yeah. fire. And that's when Pascha is celebrated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But here in the United States, we're too far away. So it comes, it does actually come to the United States, but not in time for the midnight service. Where does it come to? Um, I think it comes to some of the big, uh, like, Greek centers, for like uh, Tampa, uh, Chicago, New York. 
I know like in Tarpon Springs, the, the day after usually they get, they have the Holy Fire and they keep it in the narthex for people to come and get it, but it doesn't come in time for midnight. <laughs> All right. If someone hates God or doesn't, you know, worship Him and stuff, but if, but when they see His presence, the judgment, do they have time to repent then? Or well, that's no, good. Just, that's you know what I'm saying? Question. Because you know, he, he who comes at the first hour, or he who comes at the twelfth hour. Yeah. I'm yeah, just, like the thief on the cross, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Couldn't have waited much longer. Mm -mm. Uh, but you, when you see the power of God. Judging, I guess I'm just wondering. So yeah, I think you can judge it. Right? I think if we're going to see here, in, in the, especially in this section, that yeah. God does all these things, all these plagues. We're going to have another series of plagues that kind of uh, magnify the earlier series of plagues. And all of the plagues were the same, had the same purpose as the plagues on Egypt back mm -hmm. in the Old Testament, which was to make Pharaoh repent, make Wait Pharaoh that. change Wait his that. heart. But yeah. what happened? Pharaoh hardened his heart. Mm -hmm. Pharaoh did the opposite of what he was, what these plagues were intended to do. And the same thing we're going to see here uh, as we read this chapter, in the next couple of chapters, is that all after all of these plagues, the people, the, the wicked, don't yes. repent. Mm -hmm. There was their opportunity to repent, but they hardened their heart like Pharaoh. So at a certain point, you know, God God respects man's free will. So he gives him these opportunities to repent, but some men are going to choose not to repent. And uh, and then we say, of course, you know, when we die, our time for repentance is over. So that's why we focus on being prepared in this life, uh, because once we die, we, we there's nothing we can do to act out our repentance, <clears throat> right? So whatever state we're found in when we when we die, that's our that's our eternal state. So that's why it's so important how we use this life. But even in, on our deathbed, that we can make a repentance, like the thief on the cross, and we can turn our heart toward God even on our deathbed. <clears throat> Saint Constantine converted to Christianity on his deathbed, did he not? Well, yeah, it's complicated. I mean, he was baptized near his deathbed, yeah. was, but that was common at the time, actually. So I would say he converted. He 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 became Christian earlier than he was baptized, which was common for the time. Uh, but he was only baptized later. But if if you live a life following Christ and everything and doing what you you know what you're supposed to do, but just so happens you die on the day that you're bad. <laughs> That's why we're going to be here. ask about me. <laughs> but if we die on the day that we're not so, living a Christ like life, right. is that how we're going to be eternally? No, no. I, mean, I think God will, will judge the whole of our life. You know? But still, we would we would want to. <laughs> we all have bad days. I'm always amazed. I, I remember, you know, when I when I go to visit people in the hospital who are dying, or visit people at their home or on hospice who are dying, I always try to give them the opportunity to have confession and communion. And it, it just amazes me how many people. I remember one time I asked somebody. You know, he, I don't think he'd been to confession maybe ever. And I asked him, do you have anything to confess? And he was like, eh, no. Nah. <laughs> I was thinking, I was so sad, you know, mm -hmm. because how can you not have something that you want to confess at the last, you know, this is a great opportunity, you know, <laughs> you know, but. Oh, and he takes me on that. I recall mean, Paul or his grace who said that once you've passed, we continue to pray because God will also consider these prayers. Yes. And so there is that possibility. Yes. And then was it his grace who said on Saturday something to the effect of um, those who have passed are still alive. Can yes. you talk yes. a little more about that? Yes. Just so, briefly. I would so yeah, this. those who we, you know, God is the God of the living and not the God of the dead. So we believe all those who have died are still alive in Christ. Uh, so that they, I mean, what exactly their state is, uh, is a good question. I was thinking, you know, if we resume the Wednesday night book study sometime in the fall to read this book called The Soul After Death. Oh, yeah, um, that should be good. Yeah, yeah which kind of goes through the whole, what we can know anyway about the whole process of uh, what happens to the soul after our biological death. <laughs> but the, in any event, the, the, the people are definitely still alive. 
they're still conscious, you know, um, they're not, they're like the Jehovah's Witnesses believe in something called soul sleep, uh, which we, which we say is a heresy, uh, where the, the soul is simply asleep, is unconscious during this time. We don't, we don't believe that. Um, and then, yeah, the prayers. So strictly speaking, <laughs> this is one of the orthodoxy is paradoxy. Uh, you know, that's what Father Thomas Kempfield always said, always said, um, that strictly speaking, no, the prayers that we make for the dead shouldn't, quote unquote, have any effect because it's what each of us do in our lives that determines that we'll stand or fall on our own that's works, true. right? But uh, God in his mercy, uh, so, so on the one hand, it's, God is telling us, you know, there's no reason to pray because whatever they did, uh, they did, and that's how it's going to stand. But because of our love, our love for them forces us to pray for them anyway, yeah. even though it's against the rules, let's say. You know, it's, uh, it's not supposed to work. And God in his mercy <laughs> hears those prayers because they come out of this love, this pain and love for our, for our loved ones. God will hear those prayers in the way that only he knows, right? So <laughs> he is able to. Uh, there's a funny story about this holy man. The, I think it was around the year 117, the Emperor Trajan, who was a persecutor of Christians, died. And this holy, this holy Christian kind of man <laughs> started, and he was simple. The story goes that he started praying for the Emperor Trajan uh, after he died. And he was praying and praying and praying for the Emperor Trajan. And finally God appeared to him and said, Okay, I have, I have moved them out of hell, but stop praying. For them. <laughs> but do we not believe that when we're in the church, when in, in the liturgy, all everybody that has died, the church triumphant. Yes. Is there. Yes, to my mother, my daddy, y'all's anybody that you've lost, their yes. spirit is in the church yes. praying and with in us. Hebrews it says we're surrounded by a cloud, so it's such a great cloud of witnesses, yeah. right? And yeah. All those who have passed before us. And then the and in the preparation of the holy gifts, yeah. we, we commemorate the living and the dead together. together. Because then they dead. go in together into the chalice, which is the, the blood of Christ, mm -hmm. the presence of Christ. So they're they 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 partake of communion with us. So that's a kind of beautiful imagery that when we when we especially when we give the names of our loved ones who have passed and those who are alive, then we actually take communion with them. We're we're connected and bound with them when we take communion. Yeah, I mean our body's in the ground deteriorating like it's right. supposed to, but our spirit is still alive. Yes. yes. And the body will be resurrected. Yeah. Is yes. there something I heard it explain once that the prayers are almost evidence of your life because if you were a loving person and you left people behind you who love you and are concerned about you, they'll pray for you. Yeah. Then it's sort of evidence of how much love you've left. Yeah. And I, I remember visiting here once in Wickersville, Kansas City, and there was an 85th memorial. Mm. Wow. And I'm like, wow, somebody's been praying with this person for 85 years. That's that person great. obviously left a very loving legacy. Right. So those prayers are sort of stacked up as good evidence. Yeah. That's what I heard once. Yeah. Uh, anything to that? And there's also a tradition. I mean, in the ancient in the ancient Roman world, it was you know you had the very very rich, and then you had everybody else. There was no middle class like there is modern times. And so the the very wealthy would often uh, leave large gifts at their death uh, to the church, in order that the people. So let's say. Uh, say I was wealthy and I left the money to build a new church uh, at my death. <laughs> then the people who would gather in that new church, who enjoyed having the new church, in return they would pray for me, right? So this was this exists even to this day where we, we just just recently we had somebody um, uh, somebody <laughs> die and the family collected money uh, the people donated in memory of this person and they gave it to me to go buy uh, and I bought a nice silver chalice and patent set in Greece and brought it back for the Camp of Cactus. You know, and so now uh, every time that we use that, that person is remembered uh, on in the Eucharist. You know, that's, that's a beautiful way to remember the person and to kind of encourage prayers. People would also, uh, 
And that's why people would, would put their names sometimes on, you know, sometimes they would buy a chalice or something and they would have the name engraved of their, of their one who passed so that the priest would remember to pray for that person, <laughs> you know. Father, when you, like in Hapakakis, when you use the, the patent and the chalice, does that in itself commemorate the person who donated it? Or do you have to, you personally, one of the other priests have to consciously pray? I would say both. I would say both. I mean, yeah, but it's good for the priests to to pray and to say the person's name too. And then because we put a particle in a particle of the bread that represents that person's soul, and that particle then goes into the uh, to the wine, to the blood of Christ, and so it's like it really takes communion. Uh, so yeah, but I would say both. But yeah, you see that, especially in Greece, you see that a lot of people leaving gifts to the church uh, because they want to be remembered in the prayers. When you do those prayers, the congregation sits. Why don't we encourage them to sing? Mm -hmm. You know, in the monasteries, they um, at the time when, they're, when the priest is back there reading, um, reading the names and putting the particles in for each of the names, as he as he's about to start doing it, they ring a little bell. That's what I was. So if you ever hear in a monastery during Orthros, you hear a little bell ring. That's what's going on, and the people you'll see that for those who know, and sometimes in the parishes in Greece, you'll see this. They'll, they'll ring the bell, and you'll see everyone stand up. They did that at Timio Stavro, the little church. So okay. Like, so can we hit the chalice for people to stand up? Because that's a little bell. <laughs> Yeah, there's supposed to be a bell. They used to ring a bell for us to stand yeah. up and sit down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like when we do the petitions, like when the bishop is here and stuff, and then a lot of and Father Paul during the petitions, we used to always sit down. Yeah, but for some reason, everybody's standing up these days, unless it's like this past Sunday when the he bishop, sit down. yeah, what is the proper yeah. thing to do? Sit down. I think you. you the proper thing is to stand. The whole time. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. I mean, it's an American thing where we tell people to sit down. Yeah. In Greece, they never, you never, they never sit. tell. Mm -hmm. Unless it's something unusual. Um, That's they, why they don't go to church for yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> it's not that we can't sit down. It's just not that. It's not. So, for example, let's say the rule is that you're never supposed to sit yeah. down. So, how am I supposed to go tell you sit down? Right? The, yeah. the, the Orthodox ethos, the Orthodox mind, mindset is that. I should stand, but if I need to sit, I sit. Yes. You know, and that's it. I mean, if you're if you're older, if you're in yeah, if you have mobility issues, you're pregnant, if you're pregnant sit. then you sit. Yeah. Right? Well, but I don't need to tell you to sit. I mean, yeah. you should stand if you can, but if you can't, sit, sit down. I mean, it's not the, the end of the world. But here we have a more kind of Western concept of like, well, it's, a lot, uh, it's obligatory for me to stand now, and it's obligatory for me to sit now. It's not really an orthodox kind of ethos. It's more like I should be standing unless I can't. If I can't, I sit down. And then I stand back up when I feel like I can stand back up again. And there are certain times when we should all know that there are certain times we want to stand, be sure to stand, like at the gospel. And that's when we remind people, wisdom arrives, you know, in case you've sat, sat down, okay, stand up now for the gospel. But and anytime you, know, you face us, we should be standing, right? Generally speaking, yeah, but it's not, I would avoid, I would say it's not the orthodox ethos to, to be so juridical, to be like, you know, the rule is, you know, you stand now, the rule is sit now, it's more of organic, it's more, uh, it's, feeling. It's, it's more a feeling, I mean, like, if we really recognize that we're standing in the presence of the God of all, the judge of of history, all of our judge, then probably if we were in a human court and we were on trial for murder or something, we would probably stand when the judge enters the room, right? We would show respect to a human judge. You know, if we if we had that kind of mentality, we would want to stand and we would want to dress appropriately when you go to court, et cetera, to show respect for the judge, right? The same mentality should be for the king of all. True. That we come to church dressed appropriately, that we stand when we can, it's to show him respect. 
But, you know, at the same time, he's our father, and, you know, if you have a bad knee and you need to sit down, sit down, you know. <clears throat> but, yeah, I, mean, I, don't, I don't really like the kind of rules of, you know, you have to do this now, you have to do that now. Those prayers, that's particularly um, yeah. the time to be reverent and to stand at attention. Another time, for example, that people don't realize is, and sometimes you can't hear it being read, unfortunately, is in the Orthros when we read the Synaxarium, you know, when you when we read the names of the saints of the day, we say Saint so and so who died by the sword, we commemorate this day, Saint So and so who died by fire, we commemorate this day. So just like um, I remember I, I grew up, my dad worked at a military academy, <laughs> and then and there was chapel, uh, and they would read the names of on certain days, they would read the names of men who had passed in the wars given their life. and given their life and you would stand during the reading of the names right so the same same principle for the church you would stand to recognize the, the martyrs who have given their life for the church for god but it's a you know it's it's more of a how do we acquire that mentality to think in that way yeah. rather than okay i can tell you just a bunch of rules do this do that do that but Better is if we understand the why. The reason. Yeah. No. But I don't know that the exactly when Charles is even talking about. I mean, it's, I, I don't know. No, so you wouldn't because it takes place uh, in the altar, silent. I mean, basically silent in a low voice. So the people out in the congregation wouldn't hear. But if you were uh, at our liturgy book study, for example, we went over it at the beginning of the book, the service of preparation of the gifts. And that service takes place during Orthros, while Orthros is being served. Uh, so for example, Father, for us, since we have more than one priest, Father Micah does Orthros and I do, and I simultaneously do the preparation of the gifts. Uh, but to signal to people, so people should know that it's happening, but the signal to people, okay, now the priest is at the point where he's reading the name as they ring the bell. And then people say, ah, oh, now I know what's going on in the altar. I'll stand up. And usually they would recite in their in their head their own names that they want exactly. to remember. They would pray. Uh, so anyway, yeah, this is something that comes with time. It comes with education. We're talking about it now that we slowly learn what the kind of mindset of the church is. My last comment, though. Why can't we think of or consider, since we have the pamphlets for the divine liturgy, adding for the orthos? Yeah, uh, that's right there, and people will see. I would maybe. like to. I would like to have a full set, you know, the for all the services yeah. for vespers, for baptisms, yeah. for weddings. Yes, we have. Have so a whole set of books. I give props because we we're getting more people for orthos than we have. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, oh, yeah. So. that's that's beautiful. Can you speak to this comment from Sir from Sir Ralph regarding? We're talking about the dead. When a person takes communion, the grace of the Eucharist is bestowed upon his entire kindred, both living and deceased. Hmm. Yeah, so that's beautiful. Is that a common thought? I, I don't recall hearing that before, but that's that's a beautiful thing that we're all interconnected. Yeah. And I guess he's assuming, too, that in the piety of the Russian people, of the Greek people, that they would always bring the names from right. their family members. <laughs> and so he's assuming, probably, that they brought the names of their family members. And so by doing that, they also get to partake in communion with me because mm -hmm. I brought their names to the priest. Yeah. Yeah. All right, let's see. Well, it's a little bit more. We're already at 1130. All right. Uh, 11. And the smoke of their torment ascends forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whoever receives the mark of his name. All right, so the interesting thing here is who worship the beast and his image. Worship is in the present tense. It's a present tense participle. And whoever receives the mark of his name, again, is present tense. So, in other words, they, even in this state, where they're in this torment, when they're in this fire and brimstone, still they continue to worship the beast in his image. Still they receive the mark of his name. So in other words, they're not repenting. They're, they're persisting in their uh, worship of the beast in his image, even when they could repent. Instead, they choose to keep it. It's unrepentant evil. 
Mm. All right, 12. Here is the patience of the saints. In other words, I'm about to tell you what it is. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. Faith of Jesus, again, this is kind of fun. It really should be more like the faithfulness, faithfulness to Jesus. So here are the, here's the patience of the saints. Here are those who keep the commandments of God and are faithful to Jesus. So it's interesting there that it keeps the commandments and faithfulness. So it implies faith and works, not just one or the other. Then I heard a voice from heaven saying to me, Right, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. All right, so here this is a really comforting image. Of, uh, there's actually seven Beatitudes in Revelation. I think this is the second one where it says, Blessed are those who, etc. So blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. And so clearly we're not talking about the distant future. Again, uh, this isn't just some playbook of what's going to happen in the distant future from now, because it, then it would, it would say, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on, would mean from the end of time on. So it, it's talking about from now, from, from then, from the beginning, from Christ's time. Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, so that they will, in other words, they will have the reward. Unlike the image of this torment and fire and brimstone for those who continue in unrepentant evil, uh, those who die in the Lord, those who die who are faithful to the commandments and are faithful to Christ, they are, they are blessed. And the Spirit kind of confirms this testimony by saying that they may rest from their labors and their works follow them. So, like we were talking about earlier, what we do in this life is what we stand or fall on what we do in this life. But it's also the idea that our works follow them, like Matt was saying, that the love that they created on earth follows them by people remembering them, by people remembering to pray for them because of that. So the love that we create and share with people, goodness and peace, all these things come with us, uh, whereas sin and pain and weakness die. All right, so we'll stop there. We'll pick up at 14.14 14, uh, in two weeks. Next week, I have to go to a clergy lady conference. Uh, so we'll meet again in two weeks. All right. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, John. Oh, my gosh. Or it's very lady this time. San Diego. Yeah. Oh, how much are you? Thank you, Father Gregory. We love you. Thank you.